Stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. Joan served the state of California as a member on the Arts Council and on the Film Commission. She was formerly on the Architectural Commission and fulfilled two terms on the Fine Arts Commission for the city of Beverly Hills. As an editor for Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine, Condé Nast Publications, and the Hearst Corporation, Joan covered the world of fashion, the mysteries of food, the excitement of theater, and the international art scene. She continues to find people who are on the cutting edge of their professions. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're here at the studio in the Hollywood Museum on Highland Avenue in the historic Max Factor building. And waiting to be profiled today are two actors, Paul Sand and Tim Cummings. Actor, producer, writer, director, Paul Sand was born right in Santa Monica. And in Santa Monica, he's involved in a new project, and he's going to talk to us about it. He's a Pisces like me. Yes, you didn't know that. Hmm. He ran away to Paris at 17 to study and work with Marcel Marceau. Not like me. I didn't run away. I went to SC instead. You were running away to Paris. Uh, he toured with Judy Garland, joined the Second City in Chicago, which was great, had his own TV show after being Mary Tyler Moore's boyfriend for years, and then won a Tony on Broadway for Story Theater. How'd you do that, Paul? <coughs> <laughs> I played a dog. In Story Theater? Yeah, well, I played 11 different characters, but the dog is the one that I think they caught on to. They and did like, you do that? I did. I, yeah, no, huh, what? That's that bark? Oh, yeah, no, I, yes. Tony winning bark on this yes, show. Yes, yes. Oh, I'm so yeah, glad. Yes. So, did you get tired of playing boyfriends? Um, well, n no, you mean on television and stuff? Everyone's like, boyfriend. You, I don't know. In real life, did yeah, you play no, boyfriends? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, and, uh, uh, there was a lot, big years where I was. Mary Tyler Moore's boyfriend and Carol Burnett and you know, all oh, these right. wonderful women and somehow I lucked out and became the guy to be their boyfriend. Because you were while. so handsome. Maybe, I don't know. Yes, or, or I think not, so, or yeah. something, whatever, whatever. <laughs> charming? Uh, I don't know. Maybe. Pisces. Pisces. That's it. That's it. Oh, yes. charming Pisces man. Yeah. Mm, don't ever marry one though. I wouldn't think of it. <laughs> you wouldn't. <laughs> no. So, um, from everyone's boyfriend, before everyone's boyfriend, at 17, how could you run away? What did your mother say? I said, well, sh you know what happened? They were very worried. <laughs> I would think. They were very worried. But I, I saw a movie called Children of Paradise. Um, Les Enfants du Paradis. Oui. And uh, I just sat there through five screenings. I just couldn't take my eyes off this movie. Were you in high school then? Uh, yes, I was in high school. And so that was encouraging. So maybe your mother didn't think it was so horrible for you to run away. Right. I think they both came from families and a generation where it was frowned upon to maybe be an artist. My mom wanted to be a ballet dancer, um. my father a painter, but they're saying uh, they were told, don't be silly or blah, 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 get a job. But so my brother and I were allowed to go and do whatever we wanted in the arts. And is he an actor too? He, no, he's a designer, in t interior designer. Oh, so. And uh, so, yeah, and somehow, you know, when you're 17, you just have the courage. And I saw this, this movie and uh, Marcel Marceau was performing in Los Angeles. Oh. It was Jean-Louis Barrault in the movie, but I saw Marcel Marceau and I got on a plane and a train and- There you were? Knocked on his door. I found out where he lived. And I knocked at his door, and I learned how to say, excusez-moi, mais je ne peux pas français. And that's like, you know, I don't I'm speak French. And then he answered this great world-famous mime. Well, I speak perfect English. <laughs> he talked like that? Yeah. Maybe that's why I never spoke. <laughs> that's why, anyway, I went to myself. Oh, Did he really? No yeah, one's yeah, ever said kidding. that, because no, they've no. always said he never I'm, speaks. Yeah, no. Well, in real life, he pal comme ça tout le temps. So, but anyway, he was, it was great, and I auditioned for him, 
And I got into his company and stayed there for a year. Oh, you were in the company. I got into his company, yeah. Wow. I know. It was really wonderful. And then you were on stage with Judy Garland. I thought that was fantastic. That was fantastic, yes. Are you I, a dancer? I do. I have. That We sort of started out as a lot of dancing. You mean after you finished singing opera at five, then you started dancing? Yeah, no. no. <laughs> and when I was five, I was like a dancer in the opera. Oh, you were already a dancer in the opera. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> my aunt Louise and my mom were the opera stars, and they would put pillows under there and Oh, they really would do this? They really get into the thing. That's so great. Yeah. So uh, you were on stage with Judy. Yes. Yeah, so how, shall I tell you how it happened? Yes. Okay. Us. So uh, I heard they were looking for people for Judy Garland's act. And a choreographer uh, who I had worked with before called me up and said, come down and, you know, and audition. So I get down there, and they're looking for chorus boys. And, and I thought, this is not a good idea. So, so I said, is there anything special I can audition for? And, uh, and so they said, well, just wait around. They picked all the chorus guys. Ah. And then they said, all right, get up and do something. So they started playing some musical from MGM musicals. Oh, and you I knew that well. <laughs> I just went and I just did it and pretended I was Fred Astaire and everybody. And then she walks in. Judy Garland walks in when in kind of a white Chinese pajamas and very short hair. And she's a, she sees her with some guy up there auditioning, and she was very polite, and she got very quiet, and she watched, and she was a great audience. And then she'd say, do it again, do another one, do another she one. She did? Yeah, and <laughs> then I thought, I'm going to throw up. <laughs> Because she's there? I just got so nervous. That's what I mean. Know. And so, you had no Diet Cokes. No Diet Coke. No. And I, I went out into this alley, and I'm sort of, pardon me, for, but I'm kind of dry heaving against this <laughs> wall. And then there's this little hand is holding my head, like a mother does when you're sort of sick, you know what I mean? And it was Judy Garland holding my head. And I said, I'm really sorry, but I do this when I get nervous. Oh, my. And then she said, oh, don't worry about it. When we're on the road, you can use my bucket. She said, so you were already hired and you didn't yeah, even know. She said, followed you said, into the alley. What, does that mean I got the job? And she said, yeah, could you sing? And I lied. You know, I thought, what would Donald O'Connor do in a movie? <laughs> you know, you sort of lied. You know. well, so I said, that yes. that great a singer, right. Yeah, he was so, a good dancer. And then I looked in the yellow pages and got, I found vocal coach and, you it did? turns out I could sing. Good for you. It, but knew? what was that famous thing you did with her on stage? There's a, a piece called "We're a couple, uh, We're yes. a couple of swells." Right, you did that with That's it. Like, were I you did. the shadow? I was. It was too. Well, it wasn't a shadow. Not really a shadow. <laughs> <laughs> Not a Sorry. Shadow. <laughs> no, Ooh. it was a, like an old vaudeville piece of yeah. a couple of tramps. Oh right, right, yeah. right. Anyway, so, so you did that I all did that over, with her, and that's I did it everywhere, and that's all I did, and I watched her every night do amazing. I just watched the Judy Garland show every night for months. That's fantastic. So I think from there, that takes us into the Santa Monica project because we're talking about Kurt Weil. Yeah. And or Kurt Weil. Weil, yeah. And the Cuttlefish. Yeah. Tell well, us a little bit about this. I don't want to cut it short because it's such a great project. Yeah, it is exciting. So what happened is I live near the Santa Monica Pier. I learned how to walk as an infant on the Santa Monica So Pier. you've always been there. I lived over the merry-go-round as a teenager with Joan Rose at, 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 in those apartments upstairs. And the other night, I'm walking there, and I thought, wouldn't this be a great atmosphere, this real carnival, honky-tonk right. atmosphere, oh. to put on some really dark, Kurt Vile songs about you know murder and revenge and broken hearts. And uh, I got a great, I, I pitched it to the pier people. They said yes. You mean you yes. just decided that the pier would be the perfect place? Well, it's such a. Is there a building there? Yeah, they gave me a room. They gave me a big space to turn into a theater. That's so great. I know. So you just started just because of creating it in your mind, and then you went to the right people, and they wanted it. And they were looking for live theater. Uh, you know, they wanted that idea, and they knew of my work and stuff. And, and so what did you do? You you wrote a play? Did you write no, it? No, it's not even a play. It's going to be, it's, it's a theater. It's a, it's, a, it's a theater piece, I'll say, that 
takes place in a cabaret. Oh. So we're making the, and Marie Lelan is doing the sets and the costumes and we're turning the, this wonderful space that hangs out right over the water. That's what I what, was going to ask you. So did you actually write then this cabaret part it's, of it? It's, uh, no, nothing's written. Nothing's written? Well, no. how do you know what's coming on and what's well, going on? Well, we picked on? out the songs. So you found and those? I found the songs. Were they songs that you knew or songs liked? Songs that I knew or knew of, and there, a lot of them are from Three Penny Opera. Ah, which is great and dark. Great and dark. <laughs> and it's, uh, so we're going to make it, yeah, we have a great musical director. Are you acting in it? I'm going to sing this deadly song. Which is what? What song is it? It's that? a deadly song about forgiveness, and it's mean. And it's, it's Mac the Knife sings it at the end of the show. So does Marie Lalanne, who is a great painter and comes from a long history of artisans, artists, not artisans, but yeah, artisans yeah. and artists in right. France. Yeah. Um, does she make your costume? <laughs> do you have a costume? What does she make? <laughs> she's going to do the, everything that you, everything that's visual she is doing. What will you be wearing? Uh, we, w Marie? Um, you can. <laughs> she's, uh, she's right there. We don't know. But you know, so it's and the and the sets. What will they look like? The, the sets are kind of amazing because it's going to be giant uh, paintings, but on on the canvas. Mm. So like, you can, oh, you but know, that's very circus like. That's isn't exactly it? the reason. So they'll be like hung up. It'll be like going to the circus or the free show. Well, Marie show. worked in that atmosphere with the circus and circus people and she did? Had, yeah she has that kind of feeling so she would be great yeah, well, to do she's that she's perfect what she's well, come up with so so do you call it acting or just singing it's going to be i come from this uh, group called story theater that's where oh, i won my right. t so you're tony <laughs> yeah so then the, we there's like kind of a way of moving and kind of narrating at the same time and then breaking into the song. So there's going to be a kind of a thread of a story, but it's mostly going to be um, an atmosphere, the right atmosphere and a lot of red lights. And oh, so the lighting, yeah. Lighting what about directing? Who's directing? Me. Paul Sand is directing. Yeah. So you're putting on a new hat, director and producing. It seems and building to be, a theater. It seems to be, yeah. Have you ever built a theater like that before? No. I've just been an actor and be at work at 9.30. Is, and it, is it like a black box? No, Are you going to have stadium a, seating? No, it's a long room and one wall is completely glass and you see the pounding sea. Oh, you do? Yes. Oh, you are hanging over the water Literally, like you say. Literally, yeah. And the Coast Guard people there said they could light up the ocean at night. You got everybody Get on it? your side. It's just, it seems like the right moment in it. And when, when I come or your audience comes, do they drive onto the pier? Yeah, there's a place to park. There's parking on the pier, and it's, a short, it's about a five minute walk to the end. And I'm pushing to get a rickshaw. Oh, fabulous. Uh, to take people there who don't feel like walking. Yeah. And uh, so I'm sort of battling with that kind of thing. But, and that's it. And there's several really good restaurants have opened so people can come and play. You're a real draw to Santa Monica. That would be a really draw because you're talking about the whole experience of being on the pier. Yeah, and it's beautiful. It's and can beautiful. you do it every night? I mean, would you well, be doing weekends be, or what? We're start being modest, you know, <laughs> and start like maybe Saturday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Yeah. Two weekend. shows a night. Wow. Short shows. Who Wait. else is in it? Have you cast it? Yeah, no, no, this is our, I can do this. <laughs> okay. When I besides Paul Sand. <laughs> no, no, not, no. I'm not like that kind of guy. Okay, no, but uh, you know, you, you sort of go around and you see things, and then certain performers stick in your mind, and uh, and I start. I just call these people that I had remembered from seeing someplace, and uh, said, "Do you want to play? You want to do it?" So there's an amazing young lady named Megan Rippey. Uh -huh. She's amazing. Uh, there's uh, a real belter uh, singer named Shay Astar. Wow. I want to call her Astaire or Aster, but I don't know this Astar, but anyway. Uh, there's a, a young Australian actor who's going to play this kind of cynical narrator, and he has a cynical song about luck. Uh, that's Saul Mason. Uh, I'm going to sing this last song. You have a lot of people on stage. I know, and three musicians. Oh. 
One of the musicians is, is a violin player that I found playing the violin on the pier. How brilliant. There he was playing brilliant uh, classical music on the pier. And I asked the pier boss, how do we find him? I found him, talked with him in you know, Silver Lake. And he said, yeah, I'll do it. I introduced him to the music director, Michael Roth, who's really knows what oh, so he's he doing. did all, he's put it all together. Yeah. I'm not going to give you all the credit for that. No, no. Finding I the songs. Sort of, did you work the songs out with Michael Roth? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, please. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Does he play an instrument? He Will he plays, be on? Michael Roth plays the piano and it sounds like an orchestra. Oh, that's yeah. great. So It's amazing. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, thanks for, for being thanks with for us. Thanks for having me. Good I luck like in your here. project. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Don't go away. We'll be right back with Tim Cummings. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with actor, singer, writer, dancer, Tim Cummings, who comes from an Irish-Italian family in New York. He graduated from NYU's Tisch School of the Arts. He's an award-winning stage actor. Uh, he performed with the Rogue Machine to get that award, but he's also been on and off Broadway. He's written a novel. He serves on um, a program at the Ojai Playwrights project. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. What do you do there? The Ojai Playwrights Conference. Uh, I'm the associate director in the youth workshop. That's great. The past And is four it every summers. year? Every every summer, right? They they've been doing the conference for about 15 years. I performed um, at Theater 150, which is in Ojai. I did Shakespeare up there, and the people who live up there from that invited me to be a part of the Ojai Playwrights Conference. Oh, they did. So I work under this fantastic woman named uh, Kim Maxwell. She runs the youth workshop, but she brought me on as her associate. And so for a whole week, we, we work with these kids. Where do you get the kids? They are, most of them are local. Oh, they are. Most of them are locals, and most of them have been with us um, since they started high school oh, so you just graduation. You follow them, yeah. or they follow you. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. So there is like a, a progression. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. It's and magical. what do you teach them? Well, we take them through theater games, we take them through writing exercises, uh. and then at the end there's a performance where they all get up and perform their work, and they write everything, and we don't censor them. We tell the parents and we tell the community. Be careful if you're easily offended. We oh. don't censor their language. <laughs> you know, we let them deal with all of the extraordinary things that they deal with as creative youngsters. So, what age group? Uh, fourteen to eighteen. Oh, primarily. so you? Oh, so you've got mm -hmm. like budding, mm -hmm. budding playwrights, budding actors. Every the in storytellers all the of the future. That's great. I love it. So you say you come from an Italian Irish side yeah. family. What yeah. side comes out yeah. more on the stage? Oh my gosh. Well, strangely enough, Jewish. Oh, the Jewish side. <laughs> Is that in with the Italian I, side? I don't know. I just, I, I play a lot of Jewish, man. I'm doing it now. Um, <laughs> I guess it's the, I guess it's the, the, the fire and the passion that's From the Italian the two, side. From yeah. the Italian and the yeah. Irish. Yes. Um, I, I have played a lot of Irish guys. Uh, in Burbank, there's a theater called Theater Banshee, and I, they primarily do Irish plays, and I work there oh, a lot. Oh, they do? Yeah. Um, so, so you have the brogue, and you, or I've, do you? Yes, I've conquered every major Irish dialect from oh, each of the regions, <laughs> north, south, east, west. I know them all. But you didn't get them at home. You I had to learn them. At home. <laughs> I had to learn them. Yeah. Unfortunately, I had to learn them. But I didn't need to learn um, about cursing and drinking. Oh, you that, knew that. That, that, that came, that came my, okay. My dad was a fire lieutenant with the New York Fire Department, so I grew up around firemen and policemen. Oh, that's very interesting. Uh, that's they really were everywhere. great. So. After school then, where did you go? Did you come to LA or did you no. work in New York? I did. I, I lived in New York City and I worked in New York City. In, uh, in acting, in the stage? Yeah. I mean, from your, from yeah. your, uh, yeah, from the, Tisch from the school, work. Yeah. <laughs> from your, yeah, at Tisch school, I met, uh, I met up with, um, two teachers who then, uh, had companies outside of, uh, teaching. Oh. And one was Big Dance Theater, 
and I did a lot of shows with them in New York and toured the world with them. And another one was called the Builders Association. Really? And they were kind of a subsidiary of the Wooster Group. Oh, that's they did fabulous, this, right. This incredibly uh, diverse, monstrous, epic, multimedia type of work. And you have to do things that you never think you could do. You have to make people in the audience believe you're doing things that that it's like it's like I call it quantum leaping <laughs> you know you have one foot in the real world and another yeah. foot in this imagined world exactly. and you have to coexist in them simultaneously and if you're good at it and you know when oh, someone's good at boy, it it's hard isn't it's it it's magical so Fantastic. you were in New York did you, and and you were touring and I toured around for a while and then I tired out I got I sort of burned out from that and I decided just to stay in New York and I started doing theater and I sort of worked myself up from off off Broadway to off Broadway and then made it to Broadway and after that uh, I Wait, came stop. out to LA. Wait, stop. Stop. You made it to Broadway. Uh, it to Broadway. while you were going da, da 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 you weren't considering a film career at that point. I was considering an everything career. Oh, you and were. Still am. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> we've got off Broadway touring yeah. and we get to Broadway. Yeah. Stop there. Frankie and Johnny at the yes. Claire de Lune. Yes. Tell Frankie us about Charlie. that. So. So you didn't just wake up overnight and end up on Broadway. You you showed that you went this way to get there. I did. It's a really it's a really thrilling and interesting story, and it also comes full, full circle. Full circle. Right I now. know. That's what I want you to tell so, us. So, I was a member of a theater company called the Flea, which is owned by oh. uh, artistic director Jim Simpson, uh, who is the husband of Sigourney Weaver. And I was a company member there for several years. And so the Flea, oh, the Flea Theater. Yeah. And I was a company member there at the time that September 11th happened. And the theater was in close proximity to the towers, and so was the office that I worked in. I had a day job in this office, and my <laughs> whole life was changed irrevocably by September 11th. Um, to make a long story short. Uh, a couple months after it happened, Jim and Sigourney were at a dinner where they met. They happened to meet a journalist who had the experience of helping a fire captain write the eulogies for all the men oh. who died in his firehouse. Oh, wow. And, and you Jim, just said your father was a firefighter, yeah. too, right? Yeah. And okay, so he, Jim said, I think that's a play. Oh. And Ann Nelson was her name, and she wrote this play, and Sigourney played the journalist and they brought in Bill Murray to play the fire captain. And I was plucked from the company to understudy the part, probably because Jim knew that I had an understanding of this world. Under Bill Murray's part, yeah. understudy. I think he knew that I understood mm -hmm. the world Be of the firemen. Right, yeah. that's why I was just... Even though I was 20 years too young, however, on, oh. in, on stage, you can pull it off. I'm very transformative. You, you can change your voice, you can change your body, most people didn't know at the time that I was only 28. Is that Most right? Most people really thought I was wow. in my late 40s, which is astonishing. It shows yeah, you right. the power of right. theater, right? Right, right. So um, the cast revolved every so often, and Swoozy Kurtz and Tim Robin came oh, in. Right. Tim Robbins. And, and the name of it was? The Guys. The Guys. It was okay. called The Guys. Uh, I went on one night for an indisposed Tim Robbins. And Joe Mantello happened to be in the audience. And he saw me do the work. Oh. He then had his people call me. And they said, well, will you come in and audition for Frankie and Johnny on Broadway with Stanley Tucci oh, and yeah. Edie Falco? And I said, well, that's so nice of them <laughs> to want to audition me. Right. But I have no shot in hell. I know. And, you know, I wasn't this... I wasn't, I, I'm not the same physical type as Stanley Tucci. Any Chichi. of it, right, any of it, so. But I think because I did not expect it at all. I wasn't terribly nervous. I thought it would just be a really good opportunity to go before some of the biggest Broadway producers. And, of course, Joe Mantel is a genius. Really? But I booked it. So you went? So I booked it and I got it. And I spent, <laughs> I don't know, almost a year um, <laughs> hanging out backstage. Actually, we all had but our own But you went floors. on, didn't you? I didn't get to go on. You didn't get to go I on. I didn't get to go on. Um, uh. um, we each had our own floor, I remember. Not just a dressing room. Each person in the cast. Edie, Stanley, Lisa. They were all Yeah, separate. we each had our own floor at the Belasco Theater. Who was Lisa? 
Lisa Leguio, she oh. was uh, Edie's understudy. And she's oh, oh so, so the two understudies yeah, and then the two stars. Had, <laughs> we each had our own floor. It was amazing. <laughs> and I spent my time there, and I, and I wrote a book. Oh, that's why, you beca that's why I called you an author. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So that was the book. So let's continue on this thread because yeah. Joe Mantello then yes. so was directing that. Joe Mantel directed that. And then you're now in the normal heart yes, at I was the Kenneth. Fountain Theater. And tell us about that. He played, you play Ned. I play Ned Weeks. And interestingly enough, Joe Mantello played that role uh, <laughs> about two and a half years ago when they did this revival on Broadway. Broadway. Production. Isn't that fantastic? And I think that's just fascinating. Does he, have you exchanged uh, comments about this? I reached out to him. Yeah. Yeah. So tell For us some about advice. <laughs> You really need Tell it. us about the normal heart. Let's start with that because I want to make sure that we talk about it. That's the project that um, we brought you here to talk about, the story. Yeah. It's probably the first play written dealing with the AIDS crisis mm -hmm. before they even knew that it was AIDS. So it was in the 80s, right? 1981. It takes yeah. place. In, it was written in 85. It takes place in 81. It takes place from 81 to 84 over a three-year period, and it's chronicling the lives of of these men who are dying and they don't even know why and it's the story of one man who goes from somewhat of an unwilling participant to a full-blown activist uh, right. and the story poses the questions about whether or not his methods are the right methods and and who's directing it Simon Levy oh Simon mm -hmm. from the fountain yeah he's on the artistic mm -hmm. he's the artistic director yeah I talked about your uh, dancing on the table, your award-winning <laughs> dancing on the table for, what was it for Rogue Machine? Yeah. Okay, let's finish with something upbeat like that I because know. the normal heart is very heavy. I know. And very heart throbbing, heart. It's heart wrenching. Wrenching. It's tear heart. your soul out. <laughs> right. But it's, it's also really beautiful and really powerful and really necessary for people to I know. see and think about. But and the audience is like devastated yeah. because it's like, I mean, it's tough, the normal heart, right? Yeah. Okay, go on. So tell me about your dancing. So <laughs> I did this song called Wondrous Place, which is a real song. And, and you sang it yourself? I sang it and I choreographed it. I did all the sort of Elvis moves. Really? And, and so you got an award for that and brought Rogue Machine into the limelight. I got an award for for that. Yeah, <laughs> it was, I, we won we won several awards for that. It was a uh, uh, it didn't surprise me to be honest because it's a magnificently written play. Oh. That playwright and Walsh, who's a recent Tony winner himself. Oh, I he see. wrote the book of the musical once. I think we have about thirty seconds. Give us a thirty second novel of your novel of the book you wrote. Well, I, th there are two big projects. One of them is something that I put out myself, which is a collection of stories. Oh, that's so called Orphans. Oh, that was something that I, I had to do on my own. I wanted to release stories into the world that no editor would ever go near, ever. <laughs> right. Because I kind of have a rebellious spirit, and it was sort of a punk rock type of thing for me to do. So that's... That's Orphans. Yes. And, and the then other? there's a novel called Jake Curve, ah. which is a, a full-length novel, and that's, the, that's a family saga. That's a story of a pair of identical twins, one of whom disappears off the face of the earth, and the remaining twin is left to pick up the pieces inside of a pretty harrowing identity crisis. And it follows him through a year of his life as a 12-year-old boy. Are you a twin? No, but my oh, father was. Your father was my a father twin? My father was an identical twin. <laughs> okay, so we yeah. hope. So you're writing from some place of... Uh, I'm writing from a place of truth. <laughs> <laughs> you're writing from a place yes. of truth in your yes. novel. Thank you, yes, Tim. Thank you so thank much. You what a so pleasure much. to meet you. Thanks. Very nice to have you. Thank you. And thanks for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. Uh, email me at jaquinn1 at aol.com. And keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor. Los Angeles 90017. See you next time.